The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. I'm Patrick, Head of Technology at professional services firm Collins SBA. I'm a former financial advisor who just loves solving business problems and creating better client experiences using technology. Join me each week as we unpack the tech on offer to advice professionals, stay on top of tech trends and help you break free from the analysis paralysis experience when building and maintaining a great tech stack. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can build a complete picture of your client's financial wealth. With NetWealth, you can track and monitor external bank accounts alongside residential and investment properties. Join the dots with Zeppo, a client data warehouse that connects your CRM and other tech systems with NetWealth. Discover a world of client data at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Today we're talking all things websites with Jacqueline Barton, Director at Simply Advice Websites. So Jacqueline has extensive experience in the advice industry, working in marketing and support roles and now leading the Simply Advice Websites business, working with both firms and licensees. It's often overlooked, but your website is a critical part of the tech stack and Jacqueline takes us through the do's and don'ts, how they can help and we also chat about the power of embedding other tools in your website to achieve great outcomes. One example is using Calendly to automate lead qualification. I really enjoyed this discussion and what goes into a great advice website, how it can elevate your processes and how it impacts everything else in your business. I started by asking Jacqueline what the oldest piece of tech she still owns is and whether she still uses it. Yeah, so uh, I actually use a Polaroid camera still. I really like it because you get the yeah physical output um, and it feels really like personal, it's a bit better than being on a phone you only get one chance it is what it is um but that's obviously my personal life and not work so much yeah cool so that's the the legit like instant polaroid it's not one of those sort of i think it's a hp sprocket or something equivalent where you take the million photos on the phone no. and then do that okay so no, real no time. it's not it's the legit it's the legit one yeah had it for years and years yep and now, like how often are you using it is it just when things happen or very occasionally now, um, it's more just maybe on a certain holiday or with a certain person that I don't see very often. Uh, I used to use it a lot more. Nice. No, that's really cool. I've yeah definitely got into the sort of maybe early two thousands um, digital cameras, and it's yeah it's a it's not quite the Polaroid, but it's a similar experience of of yeah not taking you know, 10 photos, just taking one or two and then just the physical exercise of taking out that SD card and chucking it into something else to then yeah. see what they look like on the big screen. That's really cool. And what about sort of modern day, uh, are, there, are there one or two ways that you're using AI either personally or in your work life? Uh, yeah, so I'm actually experimenting with Photoshop and Canva AI at the minute. Yeah. Um, I use Canva every day but the AI feature is something new with the um, editing tools. Obviously, classic chat GPT and perplexity as well, I've been uh, fiddling with just to finesse copy and make things more concise. I find that's where it shines. Um, and then it's not AI, but I really enjoy Grammarly. Uh, it's something that I think everyone should have as a plug-in automatically and then you're just using that without even realizing it's, it's very helpful. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I think Grammarly just tends to follow you wherever you are. I think on the at least on the desktop. I'm not sure if it's the on the mobile as well, but that's really cool. And what was that tool you mentioned? Is it Perplexity? I haven't heard of that before. What does that? Yeah, do? Perplexity is just like ChatGPT. Ah. It's just another another one. Another yeah, another one. Cool. And is that maybe spitting out more sort of, I guess, uh, friendlier copy than you're sort of wanting or is that just sort of trying to get multiple opinions or uh, from that perspective when it comes to using multiple AI tools to get what you need? I'm finding it in conjunction with ChatGPT is helpful because it will pull different things than what use just relying on one. Um, but I also really like perplexity as a way to rephrase things. I find it does a better job than Canva does, um, uh -huh. than ChatGPT does. 
Okay. Cool. Awesome. So I guess, yeah, getting into Simply Advice Web Subs, I'm really uh, excited for today's discussion. But I guess before we do that, do you mind sort of taking us through your origin story, Jacqueline, and then how you've got into this and then maybe why financial planning or financial professionals? Yeah, so I'm not sure how much detail you want here, but I grew up in a professional services household and studied uh, a degree in business management at UQ, actually. And um, I basically started straight away in the advice industry from a professional capacity. I worked um, as a supporting role and marketing role for several years before starting to work at Simply Advice websites back in 2020. Uh, So in that role, I ran and managed all day-to-day tasks and projects. And then now I lead the business in partnership with several other key people. Um, One of you, um, one of those names, you would know Patrick Slane, who actually Mm -hmm. featured on the podcast a few years ago um, and who founded the business. And we work really close together and he collaborates on a few key projects here and there. Uh, But in terms of staying with financial advice, I really enjoy getting to see the gaps in the difference between delivery and uh, to the client and what capacity the advisors have. And um, I've found it very rewarding to invest in continuous improvement. Cool. So maybe going beyond the website, is that what you're sort of alluding to there from a continuous improvement perspective? Well, yes. Um, We have a very strong belief that a website is far more than mere brochureware and you can really use it to enhance all elements of your process. Um, It's not just a lead generation tool. It should be supporting your existing clients as well. Um, And by working with exclusively financial advisors, we get to really deep dive into the uniqueness of that industry's problems, but then also apply that across uh, all of our sites. And each new build gets to bring in all the benefits from what we've previously learned and um, Solving individual problems as a whole, I find very satisfying as well. No, it's really cool. And it's really sort of great to hear that, um, as you said, sort of going beyond that brochure and it feels like a lot of websites are tailored to those, you know, prospective clients. So people that aren't even clients of the business. And so that's really sort of comforting to hear. I mean, how do you, have you got any examples of how you would use it to support the existing clients of a business? Uh, yes. So, there's a huge amount of ways we can do that. Something that we like to ask ourselves is, is um, how can we save time not just for our, the advisor but for the client? So, for example, we really enjoy embedding Calendly into our websites. Mm-hmm. You can do that in the call to action button, but you can also do that for repeat meetings. So, for example, your discovery meeting you send the client a link to a specific advisor's page for that specific meeting type and it's got their integrated Calendly page seamlessly within the site. But then you've also got um, a pre-discover questionnaire as well that we can embed within the site. So it all just presents really nicely. The confirmation page is also shown within the site um, and it just feels like a very seamless process for that client. Um, It's also very tailored because we pull that specific advisor's profile and bio and also the company's contact details onto that one page. Yeah. No, that's really cool. And I am apologize that I'm already getting uh, sidetracked with talking about other tools, but just to sort of um, continue on that on that vein with Calendly, I believe, so they've obviously the key part of that tool is to, is to book meetings or to reschedule or to you know, cancel meetings. Booking meetings is the main um, part of it, but I believe they've since or recently introduced much more sort of robust functionality when it comes to sort of form filling and sort of routing and all that sort of thing. And I believe that's what you're alluding to there and how that's sort of helping that process. So you've still got really one tool that's doing all that heavy lifting, at least on the front end for clients or prospective clients. That's right. So we still use Calendly for its workflow. So the automated email that goes out um, yep. firstly when they book, but secondly, three days before the meeting happens. And then mm-hmm. there's also a text 24 hours before the meeting happens. Um, and then within all of those meetings, they have the option to cancel um, in all those notifications rather. They have the option to cancel and reschedule. And also with our uh, hosted on website, hosted website pages, mm-hmm. we have the option for the client to call because they've included the contact number. And then for certain clients, and I'll, I'll 
I was going to mention this one later, but we have the um, embedded page to a specific help page for um, a client's question about the type of meeting they're going into. Okay. So just really creates um, a lot of a cleaner process for the client because they're more likely to be able to solve their own questions without having to contact anyone, but they still have the ease to do that if they want to. No, I love it. Yeah. And yeah, apologies, listeners, going sort of way too much in the detail in terms of um, skipping ahead. I yeah, get really excited about this stuff. And I'm sure you do too, Jacqueline. So I guess if we if we step back a little bit, you know, generally what is your approach to a great advice website? Like what are the key elements apart from a robust sort of calendar um, or scheduling tool, the key elements that every website should include and what should firms be thinking about? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways to break this down. Firstly, what makes a good website? And then secondly, what makes a good advice website, I suppose? So we start with a very strong foundation um, that every designer would do, which is looks good, runs smooth, is secure, mobile friendly, navigable, all of the obvious expectations. But in terms of an advice website specifically, that's where we really apply the principle of it's more than brochure and it's a very powerful piece of tech. What's really important in this industry specifically is building trust and being referable. And our core package ensures that you have not only the bare minimum from a designer perspective, but also the bare minimum from an advisor perspective. So you're compliant, you've got smart forms, you've got a clear call to action. But then on top of that, we can go even further and best practice really all out. The sky's the limit. Not only do we do Calendly integrations, but also Google reviews, testimonials from clients with videos. Um, you, We really recommend where possible for our advisors to take team photos and office photos as well to create that sense of this is where we are and you know us and that really helps to enhance that trust element as well. We also support um, lead magnets, calculators, the list goes on. Ultimately, if you want it, we can probably, or if you have a problem, we can probably solve it through your website. And it also kind of comes back to that idea of do it once and do it right. We can start with a really strong foundation and then as your process grows or you're sort of finding actually maybe this is a bit of a problem for us, we can readjust and help your website grow based on what you're observing over time. You don't have to do everything right away, but starting with a really strong foundation, you're far better equipped to make those enhancements over time. And in terms of where to start and approach that website build, there's a few things to consider. So one is you want to know what you're about. Two, you want to understand your ideal client and what actions and preparation you want them to have done before. And then three, you want to know what your ideal outcomes are. So jumping back into knowing what you're about, you need to understand what it is that you're actually doing. You can't just rock up, right? And then your ideal client, you need to understand what you want them to know before a meeting, what you want them to have thought about, what you want them to have read, provide all of that. And you want to make that as seamless and easy for them to do to save all parties time. And then in terms of your ideal outcomes, you want to consider maybe you want to be amazing at SEO. Maybe you want to strengthen your referral opportunities through uh, custom landing pages for referral partners. Maybe you want to demonstrate that you're a leading expert in the industry through really fantastic and unique content. There's a lot of different things. It's based on what what you specifically want to do. And then ultimately, we can help you through all of those things as well if you're not sure. Um, but basically, just consider what could help your business from a 24-7 salesman is sort of a way to think about your website because it's always there, it's always running. No, I love it. I think you've really sort of opened my eyes there in terms of like at the bare minimum, this um, sort of website activity or engaging someone like yourselves, it's it's a clarity exercise, isn't it? Like you need to have all the foundations in the business um, at least 
sort of sort it out first before you think about putting that out to the world rather than say, you know, websites old needs a bit of a refresh. Let's engage, you know, simply advice websites to do that. Like you need to do a lot of the groundwork first. And I assume you would help businesses sort of work that out as well. Like I assume there's a lot of sort of consulting that goes into that prior. Would that be the case? Yeah, that's right. It really depends on the client case itself. Sometimes um, what we love doing actually is working directly with the copywriter because they really get that core messaging idea direct from the advisor's head and then we bring that to life for them. Uh, but in many cases, the advisor wants to do it themselves or they have something you think is, that's existing that's all right. Um, but yes, we do have that consultative approach at first and really step them through what they'll need to do. As part of our process, we provide a very um, clear checklist of everything and what to consider. Um, we obviously want them to start with the strongest base they can. There's also obviously flexibility. If that advisor is too pressed for time, it can be easier to just use what's pretty good 80% of the way there. And then post-launch, we can go back and edit that copy or they can themselves. It's a very user-friendly um, platform for them. There's also what we call a soft launch versus a hard launch. And a soft launch is making the website live without advertising it, whereas a hard launch is, oh my goodness, we've done this, go check out the website. And that soft launch option can be really good if the advisor isn't 100% there with the copy, but it's pretty darn good. And it's a definitely an improvement from what they had before. Love it. No, that's really great. And then maybe one example would be um, you would start with the foundations, as you alluded to before, the bare minimum, so you're building trust. And then maybe a month or two after, you could maybe add the shiny calculators or even the Calendly stuff, for example. That's right. Absolutely. And it, it like I said before, it is really built for that opportunity to grow. Yep. Perfect. And would you say that you're working with a lot of existing firms where they're trying to give the website a refresh or trying to rethink it entirely uh, or maybe newer advice practices? Is a lot of advisors going out on their own, trying to start their own thing or is it a real mixed bag? Yes, yeah, so it's actually interesting. When like a few years ago when we first really started to identify the websites that advisors had were just not hitting the mark. Maybe they weren't even non, uh, they didn't even exist. Whereas nowadays it's more, most websites are okay. They exist for one um, and they don't have anything horrific on it. It's more so now about going that extra mile. Maybe some of the websites don't look as modern. That's definitely an easy one to improve on. But mm -hmm. really getting into that process and efficiency is kind of what I'm most passionate about and I think really helps set our advice clients apart. There is a lot of things behind the scenes that many of our clients wouldn't even know that we do, but there's also some very obvious things. Um, just a simple example would be we have a very centralized section for any compliance and legal and contact information. So all you do is update, say, your FSG in that one spot and it'll populate across the whole website. Same with your general advice warning or your uh, complaints policy, your contact number, you get the idea. But it's a very, very user-friendly platform. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense like in terms of the, you know, oh, no, the FSG is now been updated and we need to update the a million and one places where it lives in terms of that link. That makes a lot of sense. So doing it once and then it just pushes to everywhere is that what you're sort of alluding to there? Yeah, that's right. And from a process perspective, it's a lot easier because when you're contacting when the advisor is contacting their client, they provide the link itself. So that nice. link is always up to date. They've got that centralized important information page with all of the legal documents at once. So it doesn't matter when you, you know, if you had sent a client a few years ago, you would have sent it as a PDF where, it, and then you'd have to resend that all mm -hmm. the time. Whereas now if you're, you're utilizing that website page, you've got it up to date all the time. So it's really yep. good. Love it. That's such a, a quick thing that I guess um, most people probably wouldn't appreciate until they need to do that. So I think that's great. I guess just on that, like in terms of, you know, improving um, firms and, and making their lives easier, could you maybe share like a success story where there's a website that you've 
um, you know, you've developed it and you've significantly improved a firm's business or maybe just a particular project that you're maybe the most proud of? Yeah, for sure. We've got one small example and then I'll go into a, a whole project example. So it kind of goes back to what's your problem and we can probably find a solution to your website. So this client came to us with the problem of we have too many leads and we need to filter through them quicker and we need to make sure that the their ideal client is going through but the other clients are, are probably being triaged at. So what we did was we created a custom form where the prospective client selected either I've been referred by an existing client or I'm brand new. If they've been referred by an existing client, they go straight after a couple of questions, they go straight to book a meeting direct with a, an advisor at that firm. Whereas if they select I'm brand new, they asked a lot more questions and some of those questions even eliminate them as an option. So they're asked to self-categorize into, you know, am I a retiree? Am I an executive, etc. And if they're none of those options, they will probably just stop answering the form. And that really has helped this firm not only increase their processes, but also really increase the quality of their leads. In terms of a whole project success that's really stood out to me, we've been working with one particular client for several years now. And what I love about working with them is they're always so open to improvements and they've always got um, the mindset of what can we do better. So we've gone absolutely to town on their website. They've got just about everything under the sun. Uh, for example, Google reviews, they have three lead magnets custom made to their specific ideal clients. They've got team and office photos and videos. They've got embedded customer survey forms, which are tailored specifically, such as uh, pre-discover meetings, pre-review meetings. They've got a custom discovery presentation they do ongoing marketing and social media support. They post blogs that are tailored to their services each week. They have a custom My Prosperity page because that's their client portal of choice. Mm -hmm. The list goes on. It has just been so fantastic because we've grown that out over time. They didn't start with all of that. They're also uh, really improving their own processes. So, for example, they identified we also have too many leads so as a process enhancement, we actually have introduced full disclosure pricing. So all of their pricing is on the website straight away for every meeting within their process. So there's no price shock with clients. They charge for their discovery meeting upfront. The client is more than happy to pay that because they understand that there's such um, a legitimate and credible and trusting brand to work with. Um, and that client is very passionate about making sure that their client experience is at the max level. And mm -hmm. that really comes through with their site. No, I love it. There's sorry, there's so much to unpack there. I think just starting with that that automated um, lead qualification, like that would just be obviously it's a great problem to have, like too many leads. But in terms of automatically screening them out and advisors or whoever's picking up the phone for the first meeting or the first call has the confidence that that, that prospective client uh, in that example has been referred by someone else. So you've obviously got that sort of warm connection already. Uh, but yet you just know, or you have a much more much more confidence when you're calling these clients or putting time in your diary that it's going to be something that's come through there vetted for you, not having to go through that manual process of trying to work out are they suitable for the business, um, and are you suitable for them as a client as well. So that's really that's really compelling. And as I said, yeah, great problem to have. That's exactly right. And in the option with the they haven't been referred and they're brand new, instead of being directed to a booking page, they are given a notification that within three business days, they will be called. And then they'll go through that additional vetting process before they meet with the advisor as uh -huh. well. So there's another layer there to really protect the advisor's time. So in that example, you're not actually screening people out. It's really a lead prioritization flow. Well, depending on how the prospect answers the questions, they okay. might filter themselves out when yeah. they hit those roadblocks of, oh, I actually don't fit into any of these categories. Yeah. 
No, but that's perfect. But what you're saying there is it's not binary. Like it can go, there's more than two branches or more than a yes, no. That's really, really cool. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Really cool. And then that other uh, example too of having your pricing on your website, I think that's really compelling just to, for clients or prospective clients to have that confidence of this is what I'm going to be charged or this is the fee range. I think that's incredibly powerful. And yeah, it just it's just that sort of you know radical candor and that sort of incredible transparency that a lot of us sort of want these days and you're charging up front as well. So that's that's really compelling. And I believe as well on your website, because I know there's going to be listeners going, Jeepers, like what do these websites look like? How do I get inspiration from this? I believe you've got a sort of portfolios page where you've got a lot of the projects or clients that you've worked with and their websites there ready to sort of um, scour through. Yes, absolutely. So we've got a bit of an explanation on most of our client builds and then we've got some client quotes as well. So sorry from the horse's mouth as to how well we are to work with, which is a really great. And, you know, honestly, like we um, like to d- uh, teach what we preach. What's that saying? <laughs> Practice what we preach. Right, yeah, exactly. And yep, me, show, yep. um, yeah, the testimonials as a source of legitimacy as well. Love it. No, that's great. And then I guess maybe, um, you know, switching it up a little bit in terms of we've got these uh, people that are scouring your website, they're viewing um, this, you know, portfolio of, of really sort of shining star websites and then they're probably trying to do it themselves. So maybe let's let's talk about maybe the common mistakes that financial planning firms make and what can they do to avoid them? Maybe just a few examples. So there's a couple of ways to answer this one as well, I guess. Interestingly, and take it with a grain of salt, what we notice most of the time is the problem statement that has really initiated a client coming to us for a new website is because their existing partner isn't the right fit. Most of the time, this is because that partner doesn't understand the industry specifically. It's not easy enough for the client themselves to update anything on the website all the website is now completely out of date because no one's updated any plugins or anything and it's just verging on unusable. So I guess that's a common thing that we see. Um, Obviously, when you're coming to us with a whole new brand, you're getting to start with a clean, fresh slate, which is really exciting and therefore not a problem for you. Some of the other things that we see, and maybe these are a bit smaller, but not having a clear or consistent call to action or using very vague messaging. It's not targeted. You've got stock imagery. You're also really just building it for leads rather than existing clients. And we've already talked about Mm -hmm. that element as well. And overarchingly, it's your website exists, but it doesn't solve any problems. So there's a couple of different ends of the spectrum that we often see as examples. And one of those would be sort of a no-brainer is to think about what you want a client to do in a situation and how your tech can enhance that. So, for example, can your client easily download an ebook? Can your client complete a checklist prior to your first discovery meeting? Can your client find blogs that are relevant to their specific age group or their specific issue? Things that really sing to your ideal client and that elevate that process when you haven't spoken to them. You don't even know that they exist yet but they're already tinkering away and getting to know you better. Love it. No, some great sort of tips there coming out of the mistakes. And I think, yeah, the ebook one's a really, really easy one, isn't it? Like you're giving away, in theory, depending on the quality of the ebook, a lot of value um, in exchange for basically a lead being created in your in your CRM on your, or your system checklist as well. And just on, I guess, the blogs or the article side of things, it sort of links into my next question around, like is there, a, is there an SEO component or methodology to this? Like are we... I assume we're doing blogs obviously because we want to deliver value and and spread the the message. But are we, you know, we're keeping it new, we're keeping it fresh. Is that helping with SEO or what are your sort of uh, comments there on SEO? Yeah, so perhaps slightly better way to think about it is have you mm-hmm. done everything else first? Yeah. And are you now tackling SEO? So obviously there's a lot of little things you can do for SEO and we have sites that absolutely drive new business from this approach, but it's also really more so a tactic that you want to consider once you've got most of the other things in place. Um, There's best practice considerations with SEO as well, and there are some really quick win SEO advantages you can do. Um, Jumping into blogs specifically, 
really powerful. You've got the ability to grow SEO within each blog itself. So meta descriptions, alt tags, the um, focus keywords. There's a lot of different ways you can do that per page. And then you've also got the fact that when you add a new blog, you've created a new page on your site. You've updated your blog archive page, which is where all your blogs populate. And then in many cases, you've also updated your homepage because you've typically got a panel of your three most recent blogs there. So, and all that is telling Google, my website's alive, my business is alive. Mm -hmm. Then within the blog itself, you benefit by creating articles that are getting really uh, specifically researched within Google search engine itself or you're getting questions repeatedly by existing clients that you are then linking in emails that that client is then clicking on and actually reading the full article. Now, that saves you time when you've got that meeting with the client and obviously it also drives traffic to your website. Then you've got other things like Google reviews. So embedding that has um, substantial SEO benefits on top of legitimizing you and building trust. Um, and then you've also got on-site SEO. So there you can do meta descriptions per page, alt tags in your imagery. Um, for example, this is a what not to do. If you haven't posted a blog since 2020, it looks like your business died during COVID. So yeah. <laughs> huge red flag. We're still seeing it today. I understand how it happens. People get overwhelmed, but ultimately with platforms like ChatGPT, there really isn't an excuse to have an out-of-date blog anymore. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, ChatGPT can only take you so far. You do need to fact check, particularly in this industry. Um, obviously, you can't be giving any actual advice. You need to be very specific in your wording. But ultimately, staying active with a couple of blogs, ideally one a week um, or at least two a month, is actually not too difficult anymore. If you create a strategy within your team or you block out two hours a month to smash it out, it can be a very um, manageable process. A quick tip we often give is using a platform like Asana, Notion, Monday.com, whatever it is that suits you, when you notice a client ask a question that you think, huh, that probably applies to other clients, write down that idea itself, come back to it later. Just have one central spot for all your blog ideas. Um, similarly, if you're in a meeting and you just go, oh, there we go, that's a good one, write it straight down, come back to it later. If you can write four at once, you've prepared your whole month, and just repeat that on a cycle. Uh, for example, we actually have a blog posting and social media support package as well. Ah. So I have multiple clients at the start of each month send me their four articles and then I take it from there. To go even further, you can actually create an automated MailChimp campaign which collects all the posts that were posted from the month before and then sends it out in one clean run-up email to all your subscribers. And on that note, MailChimp is a very helpful integration tool that we provide as part of our standard package to clients as an integration where on any form, if they text subscribe, it talks directly to MailChimp. They're added to that list automatically. Advisor doesn't need to know that's happened. And that that um, then talks back to that automation uh, campaign if the client has set that up. And then nothing is done by the client. It just it happens and their clients reap the rewards. Wow. No, some incredible tips there. That's that's really great, Jacqueline. And I think just yeah, uh, picking up on how even just like linking uh, your blog posts to clients or prospective clients in emails, I think that's a really easy way to just show, hey, this website is up to date. This is what we're talking about. And it is relevant. Like clearly it's relevant if you're sending that to clients, which is a great barometer for whether it's actually worth doing or worth writing about on the website. And yeah, couldn't agree more about just blocking out time to do this. And even things too, like if you're, you know, most businesses are using say Teams or, or some sort of uh, meeting transcription tool. If you're going through maybe three or four meetings you've had during the week and picking out what came up frequently, whether it's news or or particular strategies based on time of year, for example, tax planning in sort of May, June, really easy to, to just get 
two or three paragraphs. Um, that's probably another question. What's what would you say is minimum article length if you're writing a blog? That's a quick one for you. Well, firstly, absolutely spot on. Chatting with your colleagues is a really helpful way to get not only more ideas but depth within each topic. But in terms of the length of article itself, typically 600 to 1,000 words is considered good. 600 is on the lighter end. 1,000, you know, you're getting that deeper dive. It depends on your ideal client though. If you are focusing on retirees and they've got a lot of spare time and they're really interested in getting that deeper understanding on particularly challenging topics like Centrelink, superannuation, whatever it is, write longer pieces. If you've got um, professionals, millennials that are time poor, they're only on their phone for a minute or two to do a specific task, write more succinctly. Makes a lot of sense. No, that's really, really cool. And thank you for those those tips. I guess we've, we've discussed how we sort of both love the advice process side of things, probably particularly from like an onboarding or how leads are coming in or not coming in based on how many you're getting and whether your, um, your qualification process is automated or not. But I'd love to talk about maybe more examples of little widgets or add-ons that um, firms are using or that you're using in websites to enhance that website experience. I know we've talked about like Calendly, uh, you've talked about MailChimp as well and sort of the form process there. But are there any any other tools that you're using or have you got any thoughts on things like, you know, chatbots and all that sort of stuff? Like what are your sort of thoughts there? Yeah, so those would be the two primary ones. But honestly, sometimes with this question, I think it's less about the tool itself and it's more about the process. What's the yeah. problem that we're trying to solve? Mm-hmm. Um, Zapier can be very helpful to integrate with uh, non-traditional, less common integrations. Uh, so we've done that for clients. Um, instead of MailChimp, for example, we've connected to a different platform. Um, the question on chatbots is very interesting. Yeah. And you may disagree with me, but I find in this industry chatbots are less personal and therefore not the way to go. It can work if you have put the data into your chatbot or you've, you've set it up in a way that enhances client experiences, but more often than not, we find it doesn't. Um, and in fact, that bot sitting at the bottom of the page bouncing away can actually be not only distracting, but downright annoying. So we typically don't recommend to do that one. Obviously, it depends on the client. If they really want it, we can put it in. Yeah, no, I actually totally agree with you. I think they're a lot of the time they're very useless and also cause more confusion or like angst than actually help. And also like if you're on the mobile, a lot of the time they can actually take up like sometimes like a quarter of the screen. So you, they're actually blocking content and you can accidentally click on them and it just becomes a really crappy experience. So totally with you there. I think just another one that I might um, point out is we've recently embedded like a Stripe pricing table on our website so i was sort of picking up before that we're talking about pricing but that was like really really easy like you just you just set up the pricing table in stripe just like any sort of you know you when you sign up to even like a tool like zapier or any sort of tech like calendly they've always got that that table of you know individuals teams and enterprise etc similar to that in terms of maybe packages or or one-off you know subscriptions one-off fees or subscriptions but generate that pricing table, copy the embed code and then straighten the website and it's there and it um, inherits your, be like Calendly too, inherits your um, color scheme as well, which is really cool. So, yeah, tech and tools on websites, I love it. Yeah, you're right. There's some considerations with doing that kind of embed. Um, For instance, iframes, you don't get like basically any customization whatsoever. Mm -hmm. There's a few different um, platforms that you can embed that maybe create, yeah, less of a seamless feel. No hate whatsoever, but Astute Wheel and Advisor Ratings are examples. You can't really make it look like it belongs within the website the same way you can when you're building something in the website directly. Yep. So uh, an example would be calculators. You've got the option to bring that in from a provider, pay an ongoing subscription, or you can build it directly into the website, have it for life, and customize exactly how you need. So it's something to consider on a case-by-case basis, what suits the advisor, what's the budget, what's the long-term goal. But um, there is obviously a time and place for those integrations for sure. And yeah, it just depends. 
Yep. No, I totally with you. And yeah, I sort of brushed over the calculators part, but I think that's really that can be really valuable for actually doing the back of the envelope calculation to to basically have a more meaningful first conversation with an advisor or someone. Do you have any examples of those sort of calculator tools that are out there that can be embedded onto websites? Uh, yes. So Quate would be an example. Okay. Um, there's actually, and this is no longer a provider, but we have a client who has um, multiple custom built calculators. And once someone submits that, they're actually entered into a uh, nurture campaign. So okay. that's an automated lead campaign facilitated through Mailchimp and that will just run and that's a really effective way of not only giving them more value but obviously they've entered the lead pool, they're in your system and you can nurture that relationship over time and um, also actually, and this is kind of jumping back a little bit, Mm -hmm. it's less of a tech tool but we, by working with licensees, as directly as we do because we make sure that the site is approved by compliance before every launch and nowadays that's basically an automatic approve because we know exactly what we're doing. But there are some licensees that we work very close with and, for instance, they will email us, hey, our new address is this and we'll populate that across every single site. So that um, that licensee isn't having to chase up each individual practice and all of those websites are getting updated immediately love it no that's uh, once again great tips and great insight and yeah i guess sort of talking about tips and insights do you have any or any insight on maybe trends or innovations in sort of general website development that are currently exciting you Jacqueline? yeah honestly i think my approach to this one is less about innovation itself and more about mindset so And I guess I touched on this at the beginning, you know, it used to be there's no website or there's a terrible website. And now advisors are more and more understanding that it's not just a piece of brochureware and it really can elevate your processes, Um, taking it to the next level and embracing those opportunities for efficiency and the powerfulness of what your website can do is really exciting. Um, And yeah, not only does it benefit the advice practice itself, but it obviously benefits the client experiences as well. And getting to find those unique solutions to unique problems is really exciting as well. And just the, the general mindset that your website is not set and forget and keeping that presence alive and ongoing really helps to enhance trust as well. So, Yeah. No, it's just so clear. Like it's such a critical part of the tech stack but often overlooked. So, yeah, thank you so much for your time, Jacqueline. What's the best way if someone would like to learn more? So our website is advicewebsites.com.au or you can find me on LinkedIn at which just Jacqueline Barton. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for having me, Patrick. It's been great. No worries. Thank you, Jacqueline.